In the fall of 1974, 12 members of the Palo Alto Fire Department entered into an innovative emergency medical program at the Stanford Medical School. The paramedics' responsibilities were to initiate cardiac care with patients experiencing complaints related to their hearts. The progressive medical treatment offered is what created what is known as today as the paramedic. The Palo Alto Fire Department was an innovative agency and an early adopter of this revolutionary standard of care in the field. In January of 1975, Palo Alto Fire Department became one of the first agencies in the nation to provide ALS transport ambulances as an additional service offered to their community. This is the paramedic story and is told from their perspective. My name is Jack Leslie, hired October 1962. Firefighter till 68, promoted to captain. 74, we went paramedics, so I was in first class, captain paramedic. Somewhere in the middle of the 80s, I started being as a captain, training officer, and back on shift and switching around. Got promoted to BC and, and then worked several positions shift BC, slack chief, training officer, and that was about my 32 years. Been retired 21 years. April 1st, 1994. Yes, I'm Bruce Hallberg, and I was hired in 1968. Well, I started out as a rookie. Uh, they started the paramedic program, and so I was in that first group. Uh, and I did that job for eight or nine years, and then made captain, and they didn't want captains in the paramedic program, so they put me on shift. And then uh, about a year later, they were running short of medics, so the chief said, hey, would you go back for a year or two? So I said, sure. So I did. I did that for a couple years. And then uh, Ty Cutting was the EMS chief, and then uh, and he heard, had a substantial back injury. And the EMS office just sat, sat empty for three months. And so uh, the chief said, hey, would you mind going in and cleaning it up and taking care of things? And I said, sure. So I did that for two years. And then... Uh, I was entering my final year, and so uh, I went back on shift. My name is Dan Jewell. I was with the Palo Alto Fire Department. My career started in August 22nd, 1966, and my career basically was a firefighter hoseman at first. Then after 10 years, the paramedic program started. I was in the second class of paramedics, and I did that for 20 years. You know, bouncing back and forth from the medics to the engine companies for a total of just the short of 33 years. You know, I'm from a firefighter family. I grew up in the fire department. And my dad was assistant fire chief in Redwood City, so I was going to calls when I was 13, 14 years old. Patients were turned over to private ambulance companies. And uh, not being too critical, but at the time, there wasn't a lot of medical care given from, yeah. from the point you load them the ammo at the time I got to the hospital. Never saw them again. So when you first got hired, did they have EMS at all in the fire department? No. So on my own I went and got my went through the Red Cross training mm -hmm. for a standard and then an advanced card. And then EMTs were just starting. So it's probably about 72, 73. I went to a one day seminar and at the end you got a certificate that you were an EMT. But there was no standards, no nothing for that. And w was that promoted within the department to get that training? It, EMT training kind of came along right after paramedic training. Standard for a state card. Yeah. Pretty basic. We had an E&J uh, resuscitator. Great big thing. Tanks were, God, they were like E-tanks. Positive pressure. CPR wasn't even invented then. Well, I'll tell you, before we had EMTs, if you like, we had E&J e resuscitators, and we had no training at all, but they told us you take this oxygen cylinder and anybody that's unconscious, you slap it on them and it, it would breathe for them. It had two oxygen cylinders on it. It had a rubber mask piece on the head, and you just put it on uh, inhalation or resuscitation and slap it on the patients and wait for the ambulance. In those days, we waited for the ambulance to come. What about CPR? 
wasn't around in the okay. 60s. You always wanted to be doing compressions. Yeah. You didn't want to do mouth to mouth because <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna get vomited on 99 percent of the time. Okay. So, yeah. So there was sometimes where it was you know mouth to mouth or mouth to nose or almost all the time. Oh. Bag valve masks weren't even around. Okay. You know, not in the field. You know, they might have been anesthesiologists might have used them, but in the field it was all ENJ resuscitated. When the paramedic program came along here, uh, that was fabulous, and the people behind that were Chief Korf and uh, uh, Dr. Eliastam of the hospital. So it was a great program. Uh, it was to get into it was mainly interviews. I don't think we took a test. It was an interview process. Got trained at Stanford, and I thought that was absolutely fabulous because that was over to medical school, and we were tied in real tight with Stanford because we were the second program in the county. First one was Campbell Fire, that got to be paramedic. Just and they went to services a few months before we did. They did all air training on their own, uh, and uh, and once we were <laughs> twelve of us were with over at Stafford Hospital with uh, South City Fire and and San Jose Ambulance Company. So we were about thirty six people in the class. Mm -hmm. Done trainings done at the middle school. Most of the department heads trained us, and uh, it just made a great relationship there. And then, uh, you know, the nurses, it was new to them too, they had to ride with us for a while. So the whole process, it was right right at the on the floor of all of this. The whole process was great because we established real good relation, relations with the nursing staff. And then over the years, you know, we had docs riding with us. They were assigning doctors to ride with us. and. Uh, Sometimes the interns, they take them. So, you know, it was, I thought it was great. For me, as long as I was certified, I was certified for six years and then uh, came over and was acting BC and a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought it was the greatest six years I had. It was a big challenge, big challenge, because we're dealing with an accelerated program to teach you everything you need to know for a, a narrow scope of, of practice, you know injuries. Cardiac, of course, is always big in this area. Uh, and to be able to interact with the hospital staff and doctors, so you have to be able to speak their language. So it was pretty intensive uh, training. Okay, and where was your paramedic school? It was Stanford, Okay. at the hospital itself. So we had full access to the entire hospital. And it was great because you'd, you'd run into uh, situations where you just weren't comfortable with what you were reading, and so you could go into the hospital library and do extra research. And I took advantage of that on several occasions. And who were the people that were teaching you? Uh, Charlene Souza was the, uh, um, the nurse in charge of it, and Michael Elias Dam was the uh, director of the emergency room, and he, he overwrote the program. So did you work all, a lot in line with the doctors as well as the nurses? You did after you got into your clinical phase. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, we had a lot of guest speakers come in during, during the didactic portion. Well, of course, Southern California was an established program. It had probably been going for three or four years. All 12 of us went down at once. They got a, a, a rooms in a, in a hotel. And uh, I'll never forget it because on the same floor, we had the Washington Redskins came to town to play some another team down there. And so all of a sudden, here's a football team in your, in your hotel. And, and they were just a riot. Yeah. Redondo Beach, you know. It's a neat little community. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like two squares offset, but you have one square is down by the beach and then the other one is more residential. And uh, when you weren't in school, did you get to go relax on the beach a little bit? Oh, yeah, yeah. And these guys were great, you know. They'd take you ice skating. Uh, one day they came with some old bikes, and we rode all the way up the, the beach bike trail. That's great. And back, and so, yeah, they took good care of us. Wow. Now, for you, that second class, how did that work out for you guys going to paramedic school? Not as well as the first class. Yeah, I heard the first class had a lot of fun down there. And they got to go to Redondo Beach, yeah. and 
I think the first class in anything that it's a little looser, not quite as refined, and where we stayed here and did our internships here with the other shifts, with the, the first group. So we never did travel. Well, I did travel to East Palo Alto. I felt I didn't have enough trauma, so I was stationed over at the paramedics at East Palo Alto. And after about 48 hours, they felt I had enough trauma. When we first started out, we didn't transport. I don't know if Bruce brought this up. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. There, yeah, there, okay. There, we so, would just go to the call and then a private ambulance would come in and then we'd jump on the ambulance. And even though we had a paramedic transport ambulance, uh, politically or whatever, it wasn't set up for us to transport. And then the city got into the business and in the early days they charged like $125. And paramedics had somewhat of a discretion on billing certain patients that they didn't feel were going to be able to afford it or pay or whatever. And would uh, cut some slack there. A few families. Mm -hmm. uh, at first they didn't quite like us, mm -hmm. you know, because we we're in an, it got to be, a, I, from my perspective, it got to be a good relationship. Uh, it depended on personalities, of course. But if you included the ambulance people into your, into your work, it worked pretty good. Uh, at that time, ambulance people were going, eh, you know, two steps below us or whatever, you know. But if you said, hey, we're all in this together, let's work it out together. Uh, it worked great. Uh, did we start off with ambulances uh, yes, with that did. initial paramedic program? Yes, we did. But the city had an agreement because uh, they didn't want to be taking Palo Alto Ambulance robbing business from them. So the deal was is that Palo Alto Ambulance Company would do all the transport. Okay. But the chief, being an all-risk environment, um, saw the wisdom in, in at least having the capabilities to transport. And so the first one was a standard old fan type ambulance uh, modified for all the equipment we needed, but it had a gurney and everything else. So, And there were occasions when we did have to transport. Mm -hmm. How was EMS received within the fire department in those years? Well, we're an unknown. Yeah. You know. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of name calling, you know, prima donna. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but overall, they loved us because they were going on the same calls they always did. But before, they they had nowhere to pass up, pass off the responsibility. So when the paramedic program started, you know, you'd show up with somebody seriously wounded or or um, sick, and you could tell right away from the captain's from the crew's expression. Hey, help! <laughs> yeah, and so you you'd wait right in, and then they'd kind of move to the back line and support you. Oh, I think there was some friction. Individuals, especially older individuals, not wanting to change, not wanting to. Why do we have to do this when we have an ambulance that comes in? They're supposed to do all that for us, mm -hmm. and um, so the idea of first responders wasn't really set up in their minds that much that we should be there doing something. What did they think of the paramedics? Oh, early on? Yeah. What, the firefighters and yeah. medic situation? Prima donnas. Mm -hmm. The medics were prima donnas, and um, they got a little more money. They seemed, we had freedom of moving in and out of different districts and sometimes out of the city. You know, so, and there was a, a sense of, for the paramedic, that they had, you had more freedom. But your call volume and was so much more than if you were just at one station that you felt burn out a little bit at times mm -hmm. and that, hey. But then as things went on and more paramedics were promoted to captains, things like that, they had the basic knowledge and skills at the scene. And even the ones that didn't, they were glad to see us in certain situations. They couldn't wait till we got there. Yeah. So... One hand, you know, this way, one hand that way. So. Sure. Great. Yeah. From my perspective, uh, it worked great. We spent a lot of time over there, on-duty time, over there, and, got, uh, and particularly in the evenings after our day was done. But it worked great. The nurses, by and large, were our biggest, you know, not ally, but mentors. 
and uh, and a lot of them wrote with us. A lot of them were MCIN when they started that. They didn't even have mobile intensive care nurses when we started. So uh, before we went into service, they had to ride with us to make sure we could do a job, and it was an eye-opening for them, and it was and it was good for us. It made for a great relationship. You got to realize that we work everywhere. The only places doctors and nurses work are in the hospital. So you know they're always standing up and they got a gurney and you know it's kind of a sterile environment. When you start working in people's bedrooms, bathrooms, and wherever else inside cars, uh, they go, oh, now they kind of knew what it was about and what we. What we did, and the nurses in particular on the other end, uh, when we'd call in, they got the hang of it. Things weren't going to come real quick. Well, back then, everything you did, you had to get orders to do. Whether it was to start an IV, to give a, gr a drug, a, you had to give a really good history. That was a little more difficult sometimes. With dirt, you had different personalities at the other end and uh, trying to convey what's going on here and how the patient should be treated. and. Um, later on when standing orders developed, that improved the system quite a bit. Uh, but overall, I think our relationship with the nurses was pretty good. But that was the best of times because we called in every call. Anything that was kind of out of the ordinary or if you had a problem, they always got critiqued. Sometimes they got critiqued in a hospital, sometimes we had a nurse that was on contract to do our, our CE stuff they contract those calls. They always called, they always picked out a call a month or a couple of calls a month on your shift and you kind of critique them. Well, I'll tell you what we have. We had the orange box we communicated the hospital with. Mm -hmm. That was invented by Dr. Eugene Nagel, who I was on a committee with in Washington, D.C. And then our monitor defibrillator was a big aluminum thing and I think it weighed 50 pounds. How did that work? We had to hook it up to the orange box yeah, you had a cable from the from the monitor defibrillator. Mm -hmm. Monitor defibrillator is all one thing, just as they are now, probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hooked a cable into that big aluminum box, and that's how you transmit the EKGs. Yeah, the first one I think was an AMPAC, and it weighed 55 pounds. It had a huge battery pack in it, and then a removable monitor. And so, uh, and the monitor had a, a small batteries in it, but the thing was just a monster. So we got a call to the eighth floor of the cabana for a cardiac arrest. So Gene Peretti and I were working on the van, and so we pull in and park right in front and get all of our equipment, and and I have the AMPAC. And we get inside, and the elevator's not there. So Gene decides, let's take the stairs. So lugging up that thing, up all those stairs, was, was quite a thing. And we get up there to the eighth floor, and here's the lady, and she had a paper cut, literally, <laughs> literally. Uh, but she was a New Yorker, and she said, well, in New York, that's the only way you're going to get any help, is tell them you have a cardiac arrest. <laughs> and I'll, I'll always remember that, in her cardiac injections. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it was a last-ditch effort, but... But you deliver injections straight to the heart. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, ACLS guidelines then. Well, I see sticks we didn't do very often. I did two or three of those, I think, two of them. Oh, I see sticks? Yeah, there was about a six inch needle mid in between the second and third, or third or fourth intercostal space, and get it in there and draw some blood. But uh, that went out. We did it a few times. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody was, you know, just trying to stimulate something with it. It was epi. That old AMPAC, I keep remembering. Uh, uh, Dale Hopkins was working on the van, and and you'd take the monitor out of the defibrillator when you transport. So he gets the patient to the emergency room, and he's holding the monitor in his hand with the lead still attached when they shocked the patient. And it went right up through the leads and got Dale. Oh, wow. <laughs> but he, he was always proud of the fact that he, he didn't drop the monitor. <laughs> I bet you guys gave him a hard time about that one. Oh yeah, because we didn't have spare equipment. So we always took good care of what we had, you know. Because mm. that's all you got. Yeah. When we started, we only had one 24-hour ambulance for Stanford and all Palo Alto for the seven stations. 
And yeah, we were busy. You knew when you went to bed you were going to get up at okay. least two or three times. Yeah. And you didn't, you know, if it was a transport, it's going to be an hour and a half. Yeah, remember, there was only one van. Right. And some shifts, you know, you were absolutely going nonstop from start to finish. You know, if you had time to make your bed, but then you'd be sitting there between calls writing reports, looking at that, you know, unused bed. Mm -hmm. And then morning would come and you'd have to tear it down for the next shift. Oh, I dealt with it in a lot of different ways. Um, I think what happens in your career, probably in, no matter what side you're on, is you have these highs and lows, and then you get back on it and you get highs and lows again. So when I was in a low, um, there were certain calls where you would have um, talked to a therapist, maybe something to deal not with the, the job, but it might be your personal life, but it overlaps so much, your personal life and how you perform on the job and vice versa. Setting up the program, <clears throat> interviewing the therapist, and we got a real good one back then, Phil Berghausen, and it was kind of interesting. We had, I don't know, eight people on our little committee to pick somebody. So we had pictures the first day of each one of them. And we almost all picked his picture without even knowing him. And then we found out, you know, who he was and he went on to be our. And I think that program was great uh, to have someone like him. And then I took the critical and stress training. Probably one over at Stanford. We were transporting the seizure patient in, and a Stanford game was getting out. And uh, we're right at the, on El Camino, just ready to turn on a Barcadero in heavy, heavy traffic, when a call came in from one of the dirt parking lots by the stadium. And so we were right there. There's no way we're going to drive by this. So we, I talked to the guy in the back, and he was okay with it. He was doing good. And so based on the dire circumstances, we pulled in and uh, and there was a guy there doing CPR on him. So we, we unloaded, took our stuff over and the guy the, the guy that was doing the CPR said, I'm a physician at Stanford. And I said, well that's good, don't go away. <laughs> and I, you know, I asked him, do you want to run this call? And he goes, well I'm not that versed on what you got. I said, well, let me show you. <laughs> so we showed him and, and suggested to him basically the ACLS guidelines. And, uh, and he was just tickled with that. And, and, and we did get the guy back. Wow. And then, then we took him to the ER. And as we went in, Michael Eliasdam, as I mentioned earlier, was the director of the emergency department. And he knew the guy really well. Oh, the patient. Yeah, knew the patient really well. Wow. So, it's always felt good about that.